Uh, I'm going to start my presentation here. Um, I'm not going to be able to see anything once I'm sharing my screen. So if I, if for whatever reason, anybody can't hear me, just in and say something. Otherwise I'll, I'll be flying blind. All right, here we go. Hey, Dan, we love the video here, but um, we can't hear any sound. Oh, no sound from the video at all? Okay, now we can hear you just fine. All right, how about this? Let's see. Yes, thank you. in the chat does this video represent designers trying to maintain a design system possibly i, I want to talk about something that's only slightly less fun roller coasters uh, i'd like to talk about gantt charts now if you don't know what a gantt chart is uh it's the start and the finish show kind of shows the start and the finish of, of every part of a project right so a gantt chart will show something like this right maybe there's a strategy phase starts and ends and then after that a design phase starts and ends, that a development phase starts and ends. And we see these all, but a lot of you have used Gantt charts or, or used Gantt charts at your job or, or former job. Um, and if you think about this, this is really a, a graph, right? On every graph, there's an, there are two axes, right? At least two. And um, the, the, the X axis is pretty easy, right? The X axis is, this kind of reads like a bar graph. Um, but the thing that we often about with a Gantt chart is well, what is the Y axis, right? X axis is a pretty easy one to figure out, but what's the Y axis? And the Y axis is typically uh, importance, right? And so we don't really like to think about it that way, but that's actually probably the most accurate presentation, right? Hey, so if Dan, you think about, yes. Sorry to interrupt here. Um, there's something going on with the microphone. Oh. Mm. We're hearing a little hearing echo. All right, give me a switch headphones here. Hang on one sec. How about now? Can you all hear? Can you all hear me? Is there any echoes yeah. that we're hearing it before? Uh, how about say a couple of sentences still, here? Somebody saying still echoing. Some people yeah. saying still fine. UX pin folks, what do you? What say you? Um, there is a little echoing. Um, Dan, can you try to hop on um, to by dialing in by your uh, phone? You, yeah, you want me to dial in by phone? You said. Yes. Wait one sec. Let me let me grab that. I don't have the phone number handy. Can you can can you read me that phone number? Yes, I'll drop that in the in a, a private message. Hang on just a second. Thank you.
and the audience has your back here. Hey, audience. Okay, Dan, let me know whenever you're dialed in. All right, I'm dialing in right now. Okay. Do I need a special speaker pin here? You don't. Um, I think we hear you okay here. So we'll just keep on um, running through the slides and um, if we hear anything, we'll let you know. Okay, that sounds good. This, this okay. sounds okay. I can continue this way? Yes. Yes. All right, I'll tell me if, uh, tell me if, you, if you need me to change that. And thank you everybody for standing by and, and being patient. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, also so what we were talking about was the X, the X axis and the Y axis here graph. So the Y axis here is really about importance and, and we don't want to admit it, but when you think about it, right, if a UXer is starting direct, likely you won't start the project unless you have the requirements until all the stakeholders are present or things like that, right? The project doesn't start unless she starts. Design a little, a little bit less so, um, and certain developers, the developers always get the short end of the stick, right? Usually by the time it gets to a developer, the requirements are half-baked or they sometimes they don't have the project they're on, right? But, but if you think about it, this is actually really best because if you think about what it takes to make a website, for example, the only thing that you actually need to make a website is HTML. And, and who's responsible for writing HTML? The, not the strategist or the designer, but it's a developer. And so the site may not look good, it may not function well, it might look pretty, but it will still be a website. And so it's actually more reflective to kind of do it this way. If you think about it, this is kind of close to what, what it should be if we're, if we're talking in terms of importance. And then if about it this way, it's more about thinking about it in terms of effort, right? So at it, this is not a good representation of effort, but a good representation of effort a little bit more like this. And this to me represents kind of a better shape of the world. Um, and if you, if you look at this and if you kind of abstract it or squint at it, it's a little bit like that roller coaster track that we just saw. So, but, but even though it's a, a roller coaster track, it's still a little odd, right? So if you think about the strategist roller coaster ride, the strategist has splash mountain scenario, right? Like one big drop, not a lot of anticipation, not terribly fun. A designer kind of gets a, a much well-rounded picture. You get kind of a nice climb and a nice drop, but it seems like a pretty short ride, right? It kind of sucks to wait in line all that time for just one one. Loop. And then, of course, like I said before, developers always get the short end of the st a steady ascent, build to the top, lots of suspense. Nope. And when you think about going to a theme that has great roller coasters, or maybe the last roller coaster you've ridden, with your friends to a theme park, you don't go to ride separate coasters, right? You don't show up and go, all right, this one, you ride that one, you ride the other one, and we'll, we'll trade notes. Part of the fun is sharing the experience together, right? Getting on the same roller coaster, riding the same, and actually being able to, to commiserate about it after, to be able to complain or to be able to say about how exciting that was, right? And that's for work, too, that the fun kind of comes from being on the same ride. So even though this is a better shape than the Gantt chart, what is a better shape for an entire project? Well, I'd argue it looks maybe something like this. So for example, this is a GitHub activity from a project that I worked on last year. And you'll see here a couple of, of things that are normal, right? So in the, the middle left there, the tech director and the lead engineer, sure, committing a lot of project, that makes a lot of sense. 
But one thing that was unique about this project, and I think maybe unique to some of your teams, is that if you look on the right there, the product director, and then the bottom, the creative director and the art director on the project, all of those people were all committing code to this project. And the reason for that is because we all be on the same ride together, right? We all wanted to experience all of this, this work together and the ups and the downs. And so we could help each other and commiserate and encourage each other throughout that whole thing. And one way to, to do that was to actually a shared ride. So part of what you'll see in this talk is ways that we could work better together. Um, maybe some of them are going to be new for you and, and uh, we'll keep a little bit of Q&A time at the end too. So maybe think about some of your questions related kinds of things. You know, one, one thing we'll talk about is what people should be working, what should designers and developers and engineers and UX people, what should you be focused on project? Uh, another thing we'll talk about is sort of how to be agile together. And then we'll kind of round it out by talking about, you know, how do you grow your skill? How do you grow those kinds of things? Um, all right. When we, when we talk about working with, say, especially in in-house teams or product teams, a lot of designers complain, like, well, I don't really know how to fit into Agile. Right? Agile buzzword right now. All organizations tend to say, yeah, yeah, we're Agile. We have an Agile us. And what, but when I talk to a lot of designers, what, what I realize is what, what they mean is, well, yeah, when I say our organizational, it just means the design part is waterfall. And then the engineering part is agile. Once engineering, it's actually agile. And that, by definition, is not really agile. I mean, if you look at this kind of popular visualization of agile, you know, it's kind of these, this kind of loop metaphor. And these loops could stand for whatever you want them to, right? So some of them are build, measure, learn. Some are discover, and develop, right? But whatever you want to call those things, it's kind of this three-loop track. And when I look at this, I'm like, well, this is kind of the kind of roller coaster that we bring together, right? This looks like a lot of fun. And so the premise of this, as most of you probably know, is that you break work down into small chunks. Now, of course, the reason that Agile works so well for engineers and developers is that and developers have been practicing this for years and years, right? It's built into our development, which just trickled into web development or app development. Um, years of software practices and patterns that developers and engineers have, right? They have principles like th of things like encapsulation and immutability, modularness, and all these really great techniques and frameworks for figuring out how to break up work into small pieces. But for designers, relatively newer idea, right? Not, it's not a new idea, it's been around for a, but it's relatively newer, right? So nowadays what designers are sort of figuring, maybe we do have this rich history of being able to break up work into modularness and into systems, right? You can hardly attend a design system talk without seeing some reference to Christopher Alexander's books, you know, these great books, uh, Pattern Language, um, or, you know, some, uh, I'm the first one in whatever Kickstarter or releases the, whatever the new standards manual is. I have a bunch of these sitting on my desk. Um, Apple released a beautiful book called Design and Company that's just about kind of their system of design. So one of the things that are, are kind of figuring out nowadays is how can we take that historical knowledge from people that have been doing this in the past within the design field and how apply it to what we do today? So we'll talk about that a little bit. I don't know if anybody out there is a sneakerhead. I am sort of maybe a recovering sneakerhead. Um, in 1978, Nike introduced this shoe. This is the Nike Tailwind. And this was kind of like their flagship shoe at the time. They introduced 12 product innovations in this shoe. Um, so like they basically just packed all of it into this one shoe at the time. Um, they hyped it heavily, had a lot of kind of splat campaigns that they went through. And what they found was they were selling of these everywhere. Like people were crazy about this shoe. But what they all found was that as quickly as they were selling out of the shoe, customers were actually returning the shoe stores. And what, what was happening is they were complaining that the, the shoe was blowing up. And what they meant by, by that is the way that Nike in the shoe is the part of the innovation was actually strengthening the material that the, it was made of. So they actually had little uh, pieces of aluminum inside to strengthen it. But what happened with that aluminum was that the, the, those bits of aluminum in the shoes were rubbing and against people at the top feet, kind of acting like microscopic razors. So when people were running, feet were actually getting sliced up because the, all the aluminum was kind of poking through the fabric. It's terrible. Um, and what they learned was, in, in Phil, Phil Knight's memo, uh, his memoir, um, Shoe Dog, he said, we learned a lesson about the tailwind. Don't put 12 innovations into one shoe. Ask too much of the shoe to say nothing of the design team. We reminded each other, honor and saying, back to the drawing board. I don't know if some of you remember this site. This is a great site for me. It's called, it's the Nike Better World site. And um, 
this is done by my friend Ian Coyle, and I was just blown away when I first saw this. Something like this is pretty commonplace now. Lots of sites do parallax. Lots of sites do kind of this long scrolling experience. But this is one of the first to kind of pop this style. So I called my friend Ian, and I was like, man, how did you, how did you cut this? And he basically said, like, you know, I, I was kind of playing around in the internet. I, I did this, this effect accidentally. But once I came across it in the web insert, I tried to figure out, like, how do I make this like the, the hero writing star of, of this whole site. He said, I spent all of my time on the project just on this piece, just on this kind of parallax piece and everything else and really just kind of making that as tight as possible. And then everything else, I just left plain. And then he added this nugget in here. He, he basically said, if you make everything on the site special, nothing is special. And that quote really stuck with me and it, it's, I think it's a, a really important thing to remember as we're doing product design, as we're building our websites is like, you can't make everything special. You make one thing that you do, right? And, and then that thing can, can be the star and that can shine. Um, so let's take a freeze from the site, right? Here's, here's kind of a screenshot of the site. And you look at it without being animated, without scrolling, it's kind of plain, right? He's right. It, it's just text to the left and then image to the right. And, and even by the, the 2011 standard, um, it's, it's fairly commonplace. And I think what, what writers do, what designers are notorious for is just trying to make everything really special. But what I was doing on the site was like, let me just take one special tidbit and it elevates the whole experience, kind of like, you know, kind of like good seasoning on a dish. So do that on your own work. Well, let's say for example, this is Mashable site or maybe a, a version of Mashable. Um, and this is kind of, say, like an, an article template. So if you're a designer and you're designing a news site or a media site and, and you design a template, what most designers do is they'll kind of go top to bottom, left to right, like the way, right? So you design the nav, you design the header, then you design the thing like that, and then right below that, and then the title. And, and, then you, and then you work in grids and your point sizing and you fine tune your spacing and all that stuff. And all, almost all of that stuff is a waste, right? Designers don't need to be doing any of that because... Any good developer worth their salt can set up those in minutes, right? Hey, let's put a headline on the page. Let's put a header on the page, comments on the page. Let's put a, a kicker or a image or, or something like that. Like any developer can do that. You don't have to spend all the front doing that detail work. You can, a developer can set that up and then you can miss and tweak that in the browser later. Instead, work on the thing that really make the site unique. Right, so like this little area over here, right, that's highlighted, this is a Mashable's version of kind of like a spark graph. Right? I think they call it a velocity graph or something, which is, which is the, the traffic that this and the excitement and the energy that this article has kind of been through its life. This is the kind of stuff that designers should be spending most of their time, right? Just this little piece, make this piece really special. What's the your competitive advantage? Um, and, and everything else you can just leave plain. Right. So I guess it begs the question, how do you figure out which are worth making special? Well, I've got a couple of, of tips on how to do that. Me, I, I use urgency as kind of the main driver of what to focus on. The most urgent, I think, is what should get done next. So it begs the question, you determine what's most urgent, right? Well, there are three ways. The thing is, what's buggy or broken, right? So if you're working on an existing product, probably the most urgent thing that you should focus on is fixing the stuff that's broken. That's functionality that people need to use. That's making sure people can access certain types of sort of the apps or whatever you're building, right? That's probably the most urgent thing. Okay, then the next thing, once you get past that though, right? The, the, those things are generally finite. Once you get past that, maybe the next most urgent thing could be things like heavily requested feed. So what are the things that your customers are asking for, have been asking for? What are the things that you found in usability testing that you just haven't had a time to act on? So those are the next most urgent things to focus on. And the last thing, and I think the way that I manage my teams and, and that I work with product teams when I'm coaching them, is just excitement, right? We, we write this part off often. I often talk to my, my team and I ask them, like, what are you excited? What are you excited to work on? What idea is just kind of clamoring and clawing in its way out of your head into pixels, right? What can't you stop yourself from design, wanting to work on, even if it's not the top of your backlog, even if it's not the thing that your product has asked you to work on? And, and I find that I get the best work out of people when they're about what they're working on. And that's maybe an obvious statement, but oftentimes they don't see it happening. I think that's so important that I'm often willing to let mine and my passion drive mostly most of the product cycle as a, as a product manager. 
me give you a couple of examples of, of what that looks like in action. Some of you have maybe dot dash before, but I would wager that not that most of you haven't heard of Dash. Um, and it's because it's the new brand name for a company that's been around since 97. It's actually the new name for about.com. And probably more of you have heard of about.com, um, but you probably couldn't place where into about.com. And, and so chances are pretty high that you've been there and maybe didn't even realize it. And that was kind of the problem. So the, the site was a content portal, right? It, was, it had high ranking content. You go to the site, you read about whatever, right? How to change a tire, you Google that, you land on this, you get to a site that kind of just feels like internet, you know? And, then, and you don't even know what site you were on. You learn about how to change a tire and, and you're good. And this is the CEO of, of about.com, of dot dash, Neil Vogel. Um, he explained the problem with that. He says, nobody cares about a general information site anymore. You have symptoms of colitis content on the same domain that you have how to unclog lean and how to cook beer batter chicken and how to fix my tendonitis. And so what we did was when we worked with them was we helped look up their content. So they had all these properties that were all under one domain, right? About.com slash health slash tech slash money slash home. And what was, we broke them up into sites that serve specific users. So instead of particular URLs, we created four new brands. So instead of the about.com slash health, we help them create very well. Instead of about.com slash month, we create the balance, which is a site about personal finance. And, and we have all of these in about two to three months each. And that includes everything from naming, branding, identity, UI design, front end dev, and we research their CMS um, and, and, and created new functionality. And so I don't know in your product cycles, but for my team, that was, that was really fast. Two to three months to kind of start from scratch was really fast. All right, how do we do it? It was, we focused on what was most urgent. So everybody working on the site, we got everybody in the same room. We got designers, producers, project managers, engineers, QA, content, all, everybody working on it. And we're brainstorming session with this driving question. What is going to be site special? And we had a short discussion with everybody kind of chiming and contributing thoughts. And, and we had a great list to work from. And then what we did, we divvied up people into groups based on the list that we generated. So we basically said, you know, what do you have the most ideas for? What are you most excited about of this list that we've generated? And then let's break up into tables about that. So as an example, one table tac tackled images. So all the people sitting at that table were like, you know, I have some idea for what we can image galleries across the site. Another group focused on video. Another group focused on each integration. Another group focused on advanced search. And essentially had... Is there another group here? No. Essentially what we had was we had a bunch of little multidisciplinary teams. And at the end of the day, we had each of those teams kind of do like a demo day, right? So each of them consisting of designers, developers, engineers, product managers, they kind of went in front of the room and just presented what they worked on for the day. So as an example, this is one of the engineers, Dan. Um, and he showed just a couple of quick code pens where he hacked together a Vimeo video. And as the Vimeo video hit certain time codes, it would just auto scroll you page. It's kind of a way to, sh to kind of do like a guided content or a guided tour on a particular page. Uh, another example, this is uh, Rob, he's one of their design directors, and he was doing a little screen share of, his, of Photoshop canvases and kind of show how to visualize the difference between articles and images. Like maybe there's a, a visual representation to, to all of this. Um, and one of the things that I find, kind of what Rob's doing, is I, the tools I find helpful, is actually creating some of these element collages around areas of excitement. And an element collage is a tool that you can use as a design for some of your most urgent ideas without having to worry about designing everything, right? It's not as complete as a full page, uh, a full page design, so not as abstract as a mood, a mood board. It's kind of squarely in between those. So I'm gonna give you a couple of guidelines for element collages and, and show you some examples on how you can maybe in your process to help. So here's some guidelines, right? If you're making a collage, number one, Make, work on a big canvas, right? Don't make an art size. Don't use Sketch and do like a desktop comp. You know, if you're using Photo, do like 3,000 by 3,000. Um, if you're using Sketch, do the infinite or don't do you know, kind of an artboard size, a device size, right? Keep the default canvas infinite. And the reason for that is because you want your content and your idea to form the canvas size, not the other way around, right? So don't introduce an artificial constraint this early in, in your process. Um, the next thing, make many sizes of elements, right? So uh, avoid your common device, but make any, any 
a different number of elements. So for example, if you're going to make a footer, make your footer 1123 pixels wide. Why? Because you chose it at random, right? And it's sort of like, yeah, on a wide ish screen, that's going to look good. But then make the mortgage calculator 317 pixels, right? So, okay. On a smallish screen, this is how this thing is going to look. And it'll, and it'll keep you on track for kind of making sure that your design language works at multiple sizes. And when you step back and kind of squint at it, you get a good sense that like, how this big and small and medium and in between if you have all these kind of random sizes on the page. And the last thing kind of similar to our, our third before about excitement is just have fun. Right? I, I work with so many designers like they're longing to spread their wings and do something different than what their brand standards or your typical components. And this is your chance, right? Oftentimes to jump into being too constrained already. Well, you will just use the people pick drop down thing that we that we've already got no this is your chance to have fun stretch and flex a little bit right you can always rein it in later but an element collage is kind of a perfect flex it's a perfect way to just kind of express what's on your mind without you know encumbered by anything else now other than that there's not really that right it can, it can look however you want it to so let me show you a couple examples of of some element collage so this is one that, that my team made when we worked with Radio Free, uh, and that was a, that was a news site um, for countries where free press is banned or where the government is not fully established. And so we knew as a news site, that was gonna be something where the typography had to do a lot of heavy lifting. Um, so we spent a lot of time kind of exploring the type uh, and also exploring some of the modern elements or components that, that some of the type would sit in. So you see kind of here's here, you see some calendar widgets, you see some, some sort of fallback and ideal pieces. Um, and then kind of exploring the color palette because this site exists across different brands. So how could we use kind of the same system, the same family of elements, but for each of these sites to kind of have their own brand? I imagine that's probably a, a, a challenge that some of you are all are facing at your jobs as well. Here's a completely different take on an element collage, right? And I just want to show you kind of how this could be. This is not a template or of anything. This is just kind of like working on one at a time, layering them all together as if it were a collage, as if it were a physical collage that you're kind of cutting and pasting together. So this is for a small private side of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, called Seton Hill University. And the strategies that we had for, for their site was to really appeal to Stanley. So it was not going to be a, a, a site for parents or alum or staff, it's really going to be about attracting prospective students targeted at this themselves. And so one of the, one of the approaches that we tried to take was, you know, let's kind of filter the whole site as if it was like an Instagram feed and that particular color palette, it led to a particular typographic palette. It's kind of this robot modern style. Um, and, and so how did that manifest itself? Things like calendars on phones and through the typography and navigation drop downs and, and things like that. This is actually an element collage for that same, that same organization, Seton Hill University. I'm just going to toggle back and forth, right? So, so this, is, this is one version, another version. And so what I want to encourage you to do if you want to try an element collage for the first time is just don't worry about what the format's going to be. Like try to express the brand in the way that you can express the brand. Is that overlapping elements? Is that, you know, how neatly? Like how, what are the, some of the things that, that would help you kind of express brand best? So this is another, another take for, for Seton Hill University. So coming, coming back to some of the dot dash and about.com work, when we worked well, uh, one of the things that we knew, it being a, a big content site, is that the typography gonna have to work pretty hard to strike the right tone. Now often a, a site like WebMD or, or things like that, they're often the first place that people go when they find out they or a loved one have a terminal disease. So from an art direction standpoint, this thing be professional and courteous to the, re to the reader. So even with the typographic spectrum there on the right is we didn't want to be too rigid. We want to have some bedside manner, but we couldn't be too casual because there are some, some serious top site addresses. So we wanted to be squarely in the middle, right? Be friendly, not formal, serious, but not courteous. And so even something as, as, as the rounded radius on the letter forms informed how we treated the, you know, and, and how the logo kind of influenced the, the site typography and things like that. Um, one of the things that was great about working on that project, we got to work with their, their data science team, which is just a stellar team. And what we found out was that on a site like this, users really explore a thing within a given topic. So as an example, if you're within the all section, what people tended to do was just read article after article after article about all, kind of treating it like a little mini book. 
right? That had, that had its own chapters. That inf informed the strategy that we had to the experience on the site, which was let's infinitely scroll the articles that all, all uh, wrap chapters. And then within those chapters, we kind of branded each of those chapters. Each of them had kind of a, their own custom illustration for this. Um, so you could feel like you're within the arthritis section or the nutrition or the asthma section or the, pre or the pregnancy section, even though it was in a, a larger site. Um, a lot of people that browse say Alzheimer's aren't interested in yoga content, right? So a lot of people on this site would see of one section and not at all see something else. So it seemed like a good opportunity to create these branded areas. For the balance, the, the new finance site, the goal was to demystify money so that everybody could understand it, All right? So in our research, one of the things we found came across these old, beautiful Pelican book designs, and they just struck the right tone of iconic imagery that boiled down concepts to their visual essence. So what did those kind of take the spirit of those old fashioned things and make them a lot more modern? This is kind of what we came up with for, for uh, the balance, right? We translate this into a small handful of topic areas and a user's journey and things like investing hacks or personal finance to better understand money which in turn kind of in the color palette, the brand typography and the, and kind of the overall identity of all. So those are just a few ways that I think designers can break down work into chunks and maybe work more collaboratively with developers, right? Kind of alongside us. <clears throat> now there's also a more direct way, right? which is just, if you want to work with developers or like developers, well, well if you're a designer, right? And every so often Twitter erupts into this shiners code debate, right? And this, this happens every six months or so. I think there's an easy answer to this, right? The should designers code. Um, the answer is not because John Maida said so in, in magazine, although that's a pretty good reason, right? If John Maida says so in Wired Magazine, you consider it. Um, the answer is also not even the famous non-answer depends. I think there's a more specific answer. And I think that answer is yes, designers should code. Um, but I think if we abstract that a little bit more, the question isn't really should designers code, the question is should designers learn a thing that makes them better? And that makes it a lot more clear. Yes, the answer is yes. But there's a second to it too, right? Should designers learn a thing that makes them better? Yeah. Will it be okay if they do? Absolutely, right? It's fine if you don't, but you should be encouraged to. If you go for it. Let's say though that you're one of the designers that does want to code, uh, or maybe you work with a designer, maybe you're a developer and you work with a designer to learn to code, but you don't really know where to start. They don't know where to start. Well, I, I have to, I've got three tips to be exact. <clears throat> so the first part, is with CSS, right? That's probably not, that's probably pretty obvious, but not CSS. Just learn font sizes and colors. So apologies for kind of starting with the basics here, but for those of you that don't know, right, what you see there on the right is a screenshot of CSS, and that P on line three stands for graph, and then basically you just write words that correspond to the things that you wanna do. So apologies for oversimplifying that, but if you wanna change the font size to 16 pixels, you can write font dash size, and then a colon, and then 16 pixels, and then a semi. Right? The format is easy to, easy to, to read, easy to use. Right? Don't worry about layout. Don't worry about responsive design. Don't worry about that to the engineers for now. Just learn font sizes and colors. Right? This is kind of the format. And that's it. The step one of learning to code is done. Now, as an aside, I think there's probably some of you out there that want to start doing mentoring too, and you don't really know how. Well, I think this is a good place to start. If you're a developer and you have a designer on your team who's open to some mentoring from you, Right. Learn, learn, uh, that, and they want to learn code, teach them this really cool. amount of code, right? Don't say, here's a CSS book, read this whole thing, you know, really with font sizes and colors. And that's enough to get them working on a production project with you. You put it into practice then, by on the next project you're on, you put them in charge of the fonts and the, and the colors and the background colors and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. All right, the next thing now is the web inspector, right? So once you know uh, font sizes and colors, you can kind of step it up to web inspector, right? Uh, and so here's an example of a media page and you pop it open in your, uh, in your web inspector. And if you know font sizes and colors, you can do things like change things, right? Change the page. So you can make the background color of this page kind of, if you wanted to, I always thought Wikipedia would look better if it had a background color like that. Change the font to Comic Sans because that's probably a better way to read thing web is just using Comic Sans instead of anything else. Um, if the text is small everywhere, you could just make it bigger, right? And you could do this all in the inspector. Um, and if it's just too plain for you and you wanna be a little bit more avant-garde, you could just flip the page upside down. You know, those are, those are better ways to, to read, than, you know, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a great experience for everybody. 
And, and the cool thing, if you can mess with other people's sites on the web, you can mess with your own site. So just being able to learn in the web inspector is a lot of how, how people learned initially 10 years ago or 15 years ago how to write CSS. It's just kind of lighting up the web inspector or the web developer toolbar and just messing people's sites up. I wonder what this line does or I wonder what happens if I change this or delete this. And so being, just being able to do that, you know, sometimes it's just fun to mess with sites, um, but it's actually a really good learning experience. All right, last kind of leveling up again, right? Once you kind of feel really good about the web inspector, next thing you could do is learn a little bit of JSON. I think this really helps to take it to the next level. So JSON is a pretty simple format, right? It has kind of this, this key and value pair. So you see there on line three, you've got a main color key. Right, and then on the on the right, you've got a hex code, which is the value, and that's kind of what JSON is. It's kind of like a thing on the left, and then a colon, and a thing on the right. And it's always a thing on the left and a thing on the right. Um, so this thing relates to this thing. What is the base size? It's going to be 16. What is the accent color? It's going to be you know either hex code or this particular hash or, or anything like that. And what you can do with JSON is really powerful. Is that you can actually write configuration files that control. And JSON's not the only language for that, but it's a pretty popular one, a pretty easy one to kite around right now. <clears throat> I'll give you an example of that. So Lightning Design System uses a thing called design tokens. And design tokens are a way of storing these properties, right? They call them kind of like a visual design atoms of a design system. And you can store things like, here's our animation duration that we're going to use across where. Uh, or, or here's the media query property uh, value that we're going to have. And that way, if you want to change it in one place, it cascades down to, to everywhere. And this becomes really powerful because this can start to pipe into your tools, right? So if you're, a, if you're a designer, one of the things that you could do if you're interested in something like this, interested in learning a little bit of code, is you can say this to your developer on the next project. You can say, dear developer, could you please set up this next project so that it's driven by a JSON config file? That way, I can work on the visual details and, and this is the kicker, and you don't have to worry about it. Right. How many times do designers, developers sit together? Well, one, one thing is that that doesn't often, but when it does, it's sort of this like, oh, this drab, like, okay, can one pixel up? Oh, no, no, one pixel down. No, no, one to the left. Uh, two to the left. Uh, three now, okay, go back to two to the left. It's just kind of this like laborious process. If the configuration is actually done separately, then maybe those are the kinds of designers could tweak on their own while the engineers are actually working on, on things that are, are problems for them to tackle rather than kind of like, you know, just kind of pixel pushing, you know, pixel pushing yourself. And this works the other way too, right? If you developer, you can kind of pitch this idea to your designer too. Dear designer, I created a JSON config file for you. I know it looks intimidating right now, but all you need is a minute explanation and I think you'll get it. That way you can tweak the details to your heart's content without needing me. Because, you know, some designers just feel bad about sitting behind her and just making them up arrow, down arrow, up arrow, change, change the text, right? It feels, sometimes it just feels, feels awkward to do. I want to give you an example of kind of what that looks like in action. Uh, I used to be a director at an agency in Brooklyn called Big Spaceship. Um, now in Flash, they did some of the best Flash work around. This site was part of a campaign for Epson. It's called Epsonality. And the idea was you can kind of drag around these series of slides so that you can find out what type of printer is best for you. Right? And when you play letters, you see kind of the printers at the bottom. They sort of raise and lower based on, on the number of possibilities that you can kind of create in this. Right? And there's an infinite amount of possibilities that you've got here. So what we did for them, what we did is rather than kind of write this complicated algorithm that said, well, based on these different factors, these are the printers that, that you know, will apply in the list. Kind of did it the other way around, right? Like rather than, than writing the algorithm, we just had this really crude tool where they could work backwards. So it was like rank the printers and then dial in all of the sliders to where they should be. And then that way the user dials in the sliders. If it's close to this, it will generate a list that's like this. To start, like essentially start from the results that you want. Then you dial in the slot matches the result set. And when you're happy with the result, right? So you, in the bottom corner here, there's a couple of these options, save XML to server, create XML and show in text, use XML from text field. Um, you could spit out an XML file, that goes to the developers and that's what they use. So the developers could work on this, the, the site variance and really just pipe in the data that the client was able to control until the last minute of launch and even past launch, right? Uh, same thing as, you know, here is kind of a placeholder for JSON. JSON can kind of do the same thing, right? It's pretty cool. So why doesn't this workflow happen more often? Well, hypothesis about that. I think one thing is that just our tools haven't changed much, right? The, this screenshot, if I told you this screenshot was from 2004, you know, it's, you could probably believe me. This is Photoshop and this is a code editor. And we'll, we still work this way. 
right? Designers are still doing their, their work, their majority work in tools like Photoshop and Sketch and developers are still doing the majority of the writing code and code editors like this. And both tools are intimate to the other. If you ask a developer, hey, hop into Photoshop and, and work on this, they may not be doing and, and vice versa. If you said, if you gave a, an IDE to a designer and do the work in here, they would have no idea where to start. I think only a few years have we started to see kind of this slow march into how, how industry is changing, right? So tools like Sketch, for example, are starting to change this. An engineer can look at Sketch and go, yeah, I can understand a tool like that, right? There's not, there's not a lot here. A couple of basic shapes, a couple of properties that I can change. An engineer can look at Sketch and go, yeah, I, can, I think I could make whatever I need to make in that. And same thing with a designer. A designer can look at Sketch and go, yeah, I think I could make a, what I need in a tool like that. Um, and I think that this is starting to happen more now where people are being able to work in kind of these comfortable environments, if not comfortable to them, but also comfortable to their counterparts, right? So Airbnb, for example, at least their open source library, React Sketch, where essentially you can write React components that render to Sketch documents. Now, we haven't seen a lot of that before. Right? Go the other way, right? But we haven't seen write code and then it generates the design. It's often the other way around, right? And this effectively lets engineers the design process, which I think is an amazing thing. All right, so let's talk a little the other way around. What about using design tools to make code, right? I designed something and it automatically writes the code. Now, those of you may, that may knowing will say, wait a minute, design tools making code, I know that I have seen more and I am not taking the bait. All right, many of us took the trade years ago and hoped for the promise of designing visually with great code automatically generated only to have those dreams dashed as quickly as they surfaced. But upon reflection, there was really one main thing that dream we wrong is that it kind of tried to do too much. Let me give you an example of that. In the mid 2000s, I helped start the Philadelphia office of a web design called Happy Cog. And if I do say so myself, we were pretty good at making websites, right? At the time, modern browsers supported web standards pretty well. Responsive design really hadn't come along yet. So we didn't have to tackle those complexities. You know, all of us knew the Tontech hack by heart. So what we did was we just play games to make it interesting to all of us. And so we had this game called CSS First, right? So a designer would, would challenge everybody to CSS First. And normally what you do when you're building a website, let's say there's a comp, um, the HTML, right? You look at the comp and you go, all right, what's the HTML that represents all that stuff? Just to make sure we were appropriately, progressively enhancing and doing all the responses that good web developers would do. That started to get boring after a while, honestly. So we started to see if people could still write semantic, progressively enhanced, but just from a different angle. So we challenged our coworkers to write this first without any HTML to attach it to. And it was kind of this exercise of being able to envision what you'd write before you actually write it. All right, so you write all your CSS without having any HTML to attach it to, and then you declare it done. And once you declare it done, you couldn't touch it again. Only when you were done is when you could start writing your HTML. All right, so then your HTML, after you're done your CSS, and you try to see how close you can get just by adding this in your CSS file, right? Whoever got the closest without reopening an CSS file basically got bragging rights for the day. Silly game that most, mostly we created to keep us entertained and really just on top of it. But as an industry, aren't we kind of searching for that right now? Like, aren't we looking for sort of like the smallest set of options? Like, let me write a small CSS file, try to make it all work, you know, in HTML. Um, and I've started to design more like this lately, just kind of limiting my options as much as possible. So let me show you what that looks like. Right, maybe some of you here have heard of this idea of, of the eight point grid. Maybe some of you are using that in, in all of your work and familiar with the eight point grid. It's basically a shorthand to say, you know, pick a member like eight and then you use multiples of eight in your designs is that, that you, you give it meaning by using it consistently, right? So use multiples to define your dimensions and your paddings and your margins and block and inline elements and that kind of stuff. So here's an example of, of, uh, of the eight in action, right? So all of these type sizes are multiples of eight, right? That's one way to create a type scale. And what's, what's nice about this, right? It's not the only that, but what's nice about this is that if I ever look through my designs and a number 100 or a number 87, or so, excuse me, 17, um, I know that I broke my eight point grid system, right? Even the margin in between these 80 pixels is a multiple of eight. So I know just by doing some simple math, I broke my system, right? The system that I'm working with. If you use a, a, a 10 point grid, it's much easier. You know, you can have round numbers everywhere. So everything should end row. If it doesn't, you probably de deviated from your system. Translates really well to code too, right? And you can make sure that in your code, there's a multiple of eight. 
if you if not you've deviated from your system so you can set like you know extra small text size or small text size and create your bottoms and your font sizes and, and all that kind of stuff you could take it one level further right add a little bit of complexity to get to get more scalableness set a spacing variable to eight right and you can set as basically set x small and small to a multiple of that and then assign those as your variables and then that way, if you, if you decide, well, actually, eight seems to be too big, I'm going to seven, it just kind of cascades everywhere. Use the, use the same math, use the same base, cascades everywhere if you want to change it, add some intelligence to it. One last one I'll show you of how you can dial it up, last piece of code for now, is that if you turn options into mixins, for example, which shouldn't be a big deal because you're keeping them limited, they're infinite, then you can kind of treat them like ingredients in a pantry right? and kind of treat the way that you're building web pages as you cooking, right? Using a dish. So for this box, I want medium text size and average margin bottom and use the primary color and positioning in a relative. It also makes painfully obvious where you've deviated from that system, right? It forces you to front whether or not you'd actually like to do that. So here at the bottom, I have this area for what's custom. I don't have a particular mix in for top three picks deviating from my system, but sometimes I need that. It's just making me aware that that's what I'm doing. But this kind of exists already, right? This? That's kind of why tools like tachyons and expressive CSS, comic CSS are taking hold because they're a little bit like CSS first. Like write all the styles you ever need and then don't touch it again. But I think this part where Dreamweaver fell apart is that it's sort of trying to do too much. So let's bring this back to say a design sketch, right? In sketch, I could type a sentence out. Okay, if you look right corner there, I've got all of my options, right? My, my, I can modify infinite ways. I could change the typeface or the weight and change the position and the size and form and the rotate and all that stuff. But what would happen if I made it more fine? So kind of keep your eyes on the, on the top right there. What if instead of being able to enter number that I wanted in there, I was limited in my options? So I could only increase the position of this by eight pixels up or eight, eight pixels down. I could only get it by eight pixels, negative or positive. I only had two typefaces from. I only had uh, the ability to, to add to the line height by eight. Now, limiting these options makes it a lot easier for the software to generate code that's expected and desirable because the options are finite. Where Dreamweaver got it wrong was that the possibilities and the combinations were infinite, so the software guess. And guess what? Computers are not good at guessing. Humans are much better. Computers are much better at, telling, at when you tell it what to do, being able to do things worse. So if you have finite options, the software has to guess less. And if you have finite options, the designers and engineers can use different tools to do the same thing. It's, it's super easy to know that when I click on a plus eight button on site, it just changes the class name from text small to text medium. And to do that, then you can describe this whole document in a configuration file. And guess what that configuration file would be written in? Likely some JSON. And this is not a fiction, right? This is, well, what if, you know, in, in version 43 of Sketch, which came, which came out in eight, they officially announced that they're moving their previous binary file format over to an open app. Guess what it is? JSON. So right now, all Sketch files say JSON. So the foundation is already there for us to be working more collaboratively, but we all have to do something with that, right? We've been going about this all wrong. We've been looking as like, how can we build one tool for everybody to use? But that really hasn't worked yet, right? It's sort of the holy grail. Maybe one day somebody will get it, but it's, but it's a pipe dream. You know, it's okay for designers to be using the tools they're familiar with and with, and for developers to do the same. Designers can continue to use Photoshop and see nothing wrong with that. Developers can continue to use their favorite IDE. Nothing wrong with that either. But where there's no overlap, that's where things get lost in the chasm in between. Right? So instead, let's look for the overlap in the tools that we are use. As an example, if you're using Sketch as a designer and your developer is Pattern Lab, there's a common overlap between those tools, which is JSON. Pattern Lab ingests JSON. Sketch outputs JSON, right? So you collaborate. Designers, how do you structure your Sketch files to output on file that's the least work for the developer? Right? Developers, how can you set up your patterns to read the JSON file that's the least work for the designer? Right? It's the way to collaborate. Here's another example, right? Let's say your designer already comes, is working in Pattern Lab. And your, your engineer is working in something like the content management system. Where do they overlap? Well, JSON and Twig, right? This JSON and Twig is where we should be spending most of our effort. How do you set up each of those things, output and ingest the same thing? And this, does, this is not just to developments, right? Let's say you're trying to do some intricate animation. For, does it like to use After Effects? 
There's a great plugin called Body Movement that lets you animate X, and then that exports, that animation exports to a JSON file and a JavaScript that a developer can now work with. Right? We don't need complex tools, really small, simple ones that focus on the overlap, and that'll do just the trick. Right, so let's go back to this sentence. We're going to round this out a little bit. Back to this sentiment for a minute. The smallest set of options that allow us to design just about what we need. Well, to me, that's what I would call a design system. That's, that's how I would define a design system. I don't know that our industry has a canonical I think there's some good ones that are emerging. But to me, this feels the closest, or at least the closest, what I want out of a design system. Give me all the components that I need to create an interface, but then nothing more, n none of the extras. Give me all the guidelines I need to create within the system, but nothing else. It's no design systems are growing in popularity, right? Not just because they make us work more efficiently, but because as humans, I think we crave better ways to work together, better ways to collaborate, right? It's a facilitation role. In 2001, 17 people met at a ski resort to talk about how to work together better, right? What emerged, the Agile Manifesto, which I've really come, even as a designer, to appreciate the more I try to put it, its principles into practice. Perhaps my favorite of the book is this, right? Working software over comprehensive documentation. Love that, and, and let me tell you why. If you think about the common artifacts that, that people that we all make for our work, which of these people actually work on the software? It's the developer, right? It's really the developer that works on software, working software over comprehensive documentation. Everyone else, the strategist, the UX or the designer, everybody else on documentation. Now, that's useful, right? Docu that's not to say documents are useful, but it's not software. If Agile is really a better way, and that it is, and Agile favors working software over comprehensive documentation, why do we devote our efforts to the wrong side of the equation, right? The developer usually gets the end of the stick. Everybody else gets the time. Everybody else gets the energy. The, the, the balance is lopsided. Let's find better ways to all on the software directly a, a bit more. Okay, be skeptical, right? After all, I basically just said to you, designers should code more and design more. So does that mean like everything is now everybody else's job? Well, not really. This is a framework that I find very useful. I love using this because I think it clarifies it a little bit. It's called the RACI matrix. It's M for responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. And what, what you can do with that is you can kind of list, you can make a table, right? List on the left side of here are all the tasks that we need to complete for this. Product. Somebody needs to own the interface design or the icon style or the tone of voice. And across the top, you have all the roles of the people on the project, right? Is you should assign one of these. Is, this per, is the strategist responsible for customer experience? Is the designer responsible for icon style or only informed icon style? And what you'll see is some rows have everybody, right? Top row, customer experience. Everyone was responsible for the customer experience, strategist, the designer, the developer. But you know, if you look at something like icon style, the developer might only need to be informed about the icon style, while the designer is responsible for the icon style, and the strategist might be consulted about the, about the icon style. Right? So this list kind of says, there is overlap between all of these things. Some, some people are responsible more than others for, for each of these. So when I'm coaching teams that start out not pretty non-collaborative, their races have a lot of R's and I's, right? Not a lot of, of middle. And then as they get collaborative, you see more A's and C's kind of get in there. It creates this overlap. It, it sort of forces the collaboration, but in, in the best ways. It just kind of to, to end here, I think, perhaps Greg Veen, Type Kit's proctor, said it best. He said, it all works better when you embrace the idea that product design and engineering are just different perspectives on the same thing. Thank you so much. I want to leave you with these thoughts. Over the next year, commit to trying to, to work directly on the software more and work with your teams more collaboratively. Designers, learn a little bit of code, chunk up your work better, fit into an agile world. Developers, build tools for your colleagues. Compel them to build better tools for you. Together, better tools for yourselves, your customers, and your users. Serve each other. When you do that, I think we can change the world. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Um, I think the, the viewers here are loving uh, your presentation. Um, we have a couple of minutes for some questions. Um, uh, I'm going to go with Jenny here. She wants to know, um, curious to see what workflow would you suggest for app development? Oh, that's a, that's a tough question. So workflow for app development. Um, I just turned my video on. Uh, thanks all for listening.
uh, what's the workflow for app development? It, it starts similarly. The way that I like to work with all of my teams is let's get on the same page about what we're making, right? And so everyone can know what we're making. That's engineers, developers, strategists, product manager. We're making this app. It has to do these particular things. And then everybody kind of disperse and do their own thing and then come back and there's and then come back. So that, that kind of diagram is described by a couple ways. One is described as some people call it the double diamond process, right? Where it's like everybody meet point, everybody diverges for a bit and do their own thing and then converges and kind of comes back for a critique or for a bra another brainstorming session or something like that. So that's the way that I've found a lot, having a lot of success with my teams is just gonna get everybody on the same page and diverge a little bit and go, we're gonna explore the same thing, but in different ways. I'll sketch Canvas while you explore it in a prototype or you explore it in Swift, uh, you know, and then let's come back and sort of riff off of each other. So I found some good there. I'm not sure if that's what you're getting at, but, but I, find, I find some good, uh, some good results from that process. Awesome, thank you. Um, and going back to um, the very beginning of your presentation, whenever you were talking about urgency, um, prioritizing heavily requested features has the risk of taking your product in a direction not in the line with the vision. Um, can you talk about um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a really good point. So. I would say in that scale that I gave, first one is like fix the bugs, right? Fix, <laughs> fix, make sure that your app is working, the existing thing. And then I would say I wait number two and number three similarly. So maybe heavily requested features is, is actually outdone by excitement, right? And so what sometimes one of the things that, that I have to trust is that I'm working with good people. If I've hired good people, they have good instincts. Sometimes it's better for me to follow their instincts then follow you know, a roadmap or follow a particular thing. And I realize that that's a, a, that might be a statement, but I have to trust that the people that I'm working with are really good at it. So when somebody says, I think we should ignore that piece of feedback, I think we should focus on things first, right? If I, if I can't trust them in saying that, why did I even in the first place? Awesome, thank you. Um, and before I go through uh, the rest of the questions, I'm just gonna drop a poll in here. Um, <clears throat> for the audience. And then um, we'll go ahead and continue with um, the questions. Um, here's a fun one. Uh, what font is used in your presentation? Uh, the font is called Fabriga, F-A-B-R-I. I think it's made by, I wanna say Lux type or Luxo type, name of the foundry, but it is fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, everyone loved it. And they also loved the roller coaster too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was a great video. It had me cracking up when I first saw it. <laughs> okay. Um, next question. Um, is there a good percent of time for a designer to be learning at work? Oh, man. That, that's a tough one. That's like an existential question for me. <laughs> my, my, initial, my gut reaction shouldn't you always be working? Shouldn't you always be learning at work? Is that the point of your job? Like this is a, we work in a knowledge field. We don't work in an annual labor job that we all have. We work in a knowledge field where things are maybe faster than lots of different industries out there. I feel if there's a point where you're like, I'm not learning anything right now, that's a problem. So uh, there's probably not the answer that, that you were looking for, but in, in my work, I try as much as I can, especially for the people that, that I, I work like, we should be learning stuff in everything we're doing. Almost everything we should do, we're doing should be something like, oh, I'm going to try this new, even if it's something as simple as like, I'm going to try my curly brackets on the next line on this project as instead of the, instead of the same line. Like that's something to learn. So I think learning is, is both micro. I think probably the spirit of the question is, how should we be at a, at a macro level? And I think that um, part of your boss's job, if, if you have a manager, part of your manager or your boss's job, is to be able to create a good balance for you, be able to learn and do. And if you are a manager or, or a boss, part of your job and your responsibility to your direct reports is to have a good balance of, a, of, of doing and learning. And I think that varies from organization to organization. I don't know that it's gonna be 50-50. You know, not a lot of organizations have that luxury, but you know, if I were to guess, 75-25 sounds like a pretty good place to start. Awesome. Um, so we have time for one last question. Um, <clears throat> what would you say it's the recommended team for a design system initiative inside a software company? 
the recommended team, team, team or team size? Team size. Um, I think that it's the same. For me, it's been, in my experience, it's been the same size as a multidisciplinary or cross-disciplinary team, which is somewhere from five to eight. Um, I think just in terms of, if you think about it in terms of dynamics, it's hard to manage a group bigger than eight just in general, like whether it's about design systems or it's working on a project or it's trying to figure out where to eat, you know, it's hard to manage a group that, that, that's, that's bigger than that. So I would say maybe bigger than eight. In my experience, the teams that I've worked with in, in creating design systems for organizations, it's about that size, maybe four core, core people, maybe sort of people that, that kind of jump in and out. Um, but part of that gets, starts to get a little bit unwieldy. So I would say if you're starting a design system, it's probably a good part is around four to eight people. Okay, and um, just to clarify um, the last question, um, what about team as in roles? Oh, gotcha. Um, I would say that in terms of roles, it should be representative to what your organization is. So I've been part of creating design systems with organizations that have lots of developers and not a lot of designers. And in that case, the design's job is to scale design, right? So as an example, we worked with ExxonMobil to help them create their, their design system. And they've got about 50 developers in-house and about, I think, four designers now, which is a big show, right? Which means that those four designers can't scale to the 500 developers need. So the design system needs to be able to edify that. That design system is, is very different than a design system that's designed to serve an organization that's got a 50-50 split of designers and, and to developers. My, my recommendation there would be to be representative organization. If your organization is largely developers, then it should be developers. If it's largely designers, it should be largely designers. If it's half and half, then the presentation should be half and half so that it does, so that your design, your design actually represents the state of your organization. I think if it's too lopsided if to get like, you know, if you have a lot of designers on your design system team, but designers in the rest of the organization, it's gonna feel like it's over-designed because it's representative of, of the whole group. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. That was amazing. Um, well, everyone, if you guys would like to um, stick around for the next webinar, um, we'll be here. Thank you again, Thank you, Dan. Dan. Thank you, everybody. Bye.